You are very welcome along to episode 16 of the Hurling Pod. Limerick have matched their team of the 1930s by landing a fourth consecutive Munster Hurling title. But Clare have been level after 70 minutes on three different occasions this year with the All-Ireland Champions. And there's a feeling that potentially we could have a championship trilogy next month for the Liam McCarthy on the line. A familiar tale in the Leinster final at Croke Park. TJ Reid, the top scorer in a Leinster decider, as Kilkenny win three in a row. His 12 points helping the Cats to overcome Galway to land what's an 18th provincial crown for them of the Cody era but again the focus post game was the handshake between Cody and Henry Shefflin Antrim second Joe McDonough Cup success in three seasons well that sent the Saffrons back up to the Leinster Championship for 2023 disappointment again for Kerry three years in a row that they've lost out in that final but what a final it was to look back on what was a silverware handing out weekend I'm joined by four time All-Ireland winner with Kilkenny Paul Murphy and go is 2017 All-Ireland winning netminder James Skehill lads how are you getting on? Great Will Hi Will how are you all? There's only one place to start here, really, isn't it? It's not the handshake this time round, thankfully. I was worried Saturday night when I got home. I was like, are we going to have to talk about this as the top story on the hurling pod? And then we had a game for the ages, Skell, on Sunday. Limerick just about coming out against Clare, 128-27, to after extra time, in testing conditions in the rain in Semple Stadium. The two neighbours putting on a hell of a show, level on 15 different occasions, and eventually, maybe Limerick had that little bit more, particularly in the first half of extra time to get over the line. But what a monster final it was. Yeah, I, and I think, I, I don't think anyone would argue with me if I said it was probably one of the greatest monster finals of all time. And we're, we're chit chatting there before the, the we came on the pod. And like, I, I can't think there's maybe one that might even come close to it as the 04 monster final with Waterford and, uh, uh, and Cork. But like, this had, this had everything, bare goals. You know, and, and I suppose instance of red cards, this had everything. Like, it was just an electric, an electric game. The crowd were brilliant. Like, I, I wasn't at the game, but you, you could feel it through the television. And then for the way it finished off in a normal time with Tony Kelly, I was roaring the television for not, not to go for it. You know, this is me. Like, it's too chancy. How could he go for it? Like, and then he does that. And then, and, and, and he, he did it while some clown threw a bottle, yeah. you know, down within his vicinity. Like, so to, to kind of enact that skill from that angle under such pressure with, with the game on the line was just incredible 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 and that's the only word I can use with the game because that's what it was um, some shooting from, from both sets of forwards like you think of Seamus Flanagan who had probably by his own admission probably an up and down you know a year so far and then he shoots he shoots where he shoots like just finds himself in great positions opens up great channels for the rest of the forwards around him and uh, look, credit to both teams they're the two best teams in the country um, I don't think anyone deserved that but Limerick just did enough um, their conditioning was is, I think is impe- impeccable if I was to say anything about clear, maybe they lost a small bit of steam towards the end of extra time and that's where just kind of Limerick just opened it up a small bit um, but look nothing separated them it's obvious that's what the draw is I think that's the th- is that the third time to draw this year yeah they're level at 70 minutes on all three occasions yeah, so league lose the low scoring game they drew in the round robin and effectively drew again yesterday so like clear can be extremely I know it's, 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 it's a little consolation to them this morning now, but they can be extremely proud and they can be very motivated for, for what's to come down the line they have a Look, they have, a, they have a run to get to meet Limerick again now. They're going to have to go through some tough teams, but like, they're well capable. So, no credit to both teams. Paul, before we kind of dig into the game itself, is it a fair statement to make based on the evidence of what we saw last weekend, where we saw you know all four of the provincial finalists in action, that it now feels like Clare are reasonably close to Limerick, but possibly the rest of the chase and pack are a bit away from these two teams based on the evidence of the Munster final? Yeah, that's probably fair to say after this weekend anyway. Certainly after the Leinster final, um, you know, much flatter affair compared to the Munster final but I think there's an element here of Clare any team going out playing Limerick you know you know you have to throw a huge amount at them and Clare brought an element of just chaos to the game because they knew it had to completely break up Limerick's plan they knew they'd throw everything at them whereas you look at Leinster final and it was far more tactical and far more cagey and that's the way both teams approached it but it, it is fair to say you have to give Clare the credit. Like Clare do look like the closest team now, out of nowhere, out of the last few months, to suddenly come and and potentially take on Limerick. And very fine margins here. You know, extra time just took the sting out of it for Clare. You know, when you look at extra time compared to any minute really in normal time, it was a it was a real it was a completely different game nearly because of the intensity. There was a bit more space in it. I mean, players were after putting their bodies on the line for 70 minutes in, in really tough conditions. We saw Shane O'Donnell, Tony Kelly, Peter Duggan, these lads, you know, you just couldn't hold out any longer. And that's the thing going against this Limerick team is sustaining not just the 70 minutes, but if it, if it goes into extra time, you have to try and sustain that. So the closest team, yeah, incredibly now is, is, is Clare do look like it. But I'd still fancy, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd still love to see the likes of Kilkenny or the likes of Galway or whoever have a crack at them because no doubt either of those teams or Wexford or whoever would feel that 
you know, or Cork, that they'd have to throw the same thing that Clare did at Limerick. It's the only way you may potentially top a Limerick is throw everything at them. But um, at the moment, you know, you'd be relishing seeing potentially Clare and Limerick at some stage again in an All-Ireland final. It'd be just, it'd be an incredible match. Yeah, because James, when you look at particularly, now, I think the energy that Clare put in eventually, like with some of those players who had to come off, and you don't want to have probably your three best players in the case of um, the three that, that have just been mentioned uh, there by Murph, where you don't have Tony Kelly, O'Donnell and Duggan available when the game is in the melting pot in extra time, but they absolutely ran their legs off throughout the match. But that first 25-30 minutes particularly, I think especially up until the moment that Hegarty scored the goal and maybe things kind of ratcheted up a bit after that for Limerick, the intensity that Clare put in to stop Limerick hurling in the first 25-30 minutes was absolutely incredible. Yeah, and I think uh, intensity is one thing. Yeah, like it's easy look at a team and say, right, they're they're, they're operating fierce, intense, but they're they're disciplined in the tackle and the way they applied the intensity in the right manner. Like, and you contrast what Galway did against Kilkenny, intensity in the wrong manner, and their tackling tackling was horrendous, uh, which we we'll touch on later. But their their tackle was it was exceptional. Um, their energy all around the pitch from all the uplex, from, from even the pace, Quilligan was getting the hook out going, and what he was doing was it was excellent. So all up the pitch, they were they were ex they were they were. Brilliant, and I don't think Limerick have met that kind of, I suppose, ferocity in the last couple of years. I don't think I, I, am struggling to remember a team who was thrown that much at them, you know, for a sustained period. Obviously, there's there'll be a couple of minutes every game where a team gets a proper patch against Limerick, but for Clare to actually sustain it for the whole course of the game, I can't remember anyone doing that to Limerick in, in recent memory. And look, it just shows it's a great sign of a great team when you're able to actually take all that pressure, keep drop. You know, Take it on board. To, to, obviously, they, were, they went behind a couple of times, but then throw everything back at them again, like, and then win, win, the, win the match. So, again, we said about the, the game in Innes the last time. Did both team stock go up? Yes. And after yesterday, did both team stock go up again? Yes. So, like, they're they're all they're both on the rise, and, and they're on the same trajectory, I think. Um, but they're still. You always got the feeling then, an extra time, that just the energy was dropping from Clare. And I don't think it's an S and C thing. I just think it was a bit of clientele. Like, the, the lads they had to bring on. You know, weren't going to be as effective as the lads that they had to bring off. You know, so like, you, and the, the, who do you want? Only the guy Tony Kelly to be there. But again, what more can the man do? Like he ran. I, I'd love to see his running chart. What, what he covered in the game because I saw him getting the ball in his own twenty-one and in the opposition twenty-one, and, and he was uh, he was applying himself. You know, for the whole course of 70, 80 minutes, like so, he's just exceptional. I know I keep going back to Tony Kelly, but like, mm. I you ne- you nearly kind of half privileged to watch this. You know, like that sideline. I just I can't stress how difficult. Like as this is how difficult that is to do, but under, in that situation, like it's amazing, and like two teams just to go ahead the way they did. I I, I feel like a giddy child here talking about them. You know, I want them to play again next week. You know? But like Murphy, you can't help but be excited by Tony Kelly. Like, I was joking about it yesterday. He was almost like a sixteen-year-old who dropped back to under twelve. Such was his dominance on the <laughs> yeah, game yeah. within the first half. And like there were moments there where you could see Limerick's frustration with the fact that he popped up in moments like there was one I think it was uh, Dimmer Burns went to roll lift to free and had to actually pull on it because the ball didn't come up properly in the wet mm-hmm. he pulled on it and you're thinking the last thing you want to do here is hit Tony Kelly you've got all this space in front of you don't hit it to Tony and somehow Tony managed to position himself just in place to pick the ball up before the Limerick defenders who were trying to get to it and Tony <laughs> Kelly just pops it over from a stupid angle he put over you know percentage shots that are way down that you should never take on but Tony Kelly is that confidence in his own ability to do it that's so hard to defend against and like Limerick almost kind of uh, they relied on their system to try and stop Clare's attackers I think for the best part it worked like they actually managed to tie up quite a few of those Clare forwards during the game but it was so hard to stop Tony Kelly because he just relishes that chaos that Skehl has just mentioned he does yeah and it's, it's, it's amazing considering how much he's targeted as a player going out, no more than your TJ Reeds or your Garot Hegarty's or whoever. Like, every team that's going to play a player will go, we have to do a job in Tony Kelly, but he still pops up and he still finds the space. And how he finds the space, I don't know. Like, he got a, he got a point in the first half yesterday where uh, Davy Fitzgerald got the ball down the right wing and struck it to him. And now there was three Limerick players in and around that area. They were kind of going zonal, but whoever was marking him at the time, he just managed to lose him. And whoever was marking him only had one job probably, is follow Tony Kelly, stick with him here now. Found the space, and once he found the space, even with the Limerick lads closed and popped it over the bar. And the free, or the one that you were talking about there, obviously when Jeremy Burns pulled on it going out. The other thing was, was like if Jeremy Burns just pulled on that and went out over the sideline, Tony Kelly was still probably going to put it over from there anyway. So it's a lose-lose situation. But I'd agree with you. The one thing I was thinking when he scored that point was a lot of other players will actually 
miss that like that's a shot that when we talk about here week on week of players taking shots from angles that isn't a high percentage chance that you're going to score running away from goal man on your back you're striking back towards the goal but every time he gets it you kind of think yeah he is going to score this he just has this belief and like you said he plays with this just freedom of as if he's a young fella playing in the pitch under 16 knows he's better than nearly every other player and can just can just do his own thing but what i found remarkable about the about the sideline like obviously enough the angle was incredible i did notice as well yeah someone threw a bottle or something at him but the angle from the sideline where he's looking at the goal like even the big screen is up in the background and it's zoomed in on him like i'm sure that was nearly between the goal posts for him that he was even you know if, if he needed any more reminding of what he was about to do or what he's attempt to do the big screen was showing him up right up behind the goal that he's about to line up in a monster final a sideline to put to to, to draw a match for Clare. There was just there were so many things about it about the game, and it's not to it's not to zone in totally on Tony Kelly. You know, we can go road Hegarty's goal, incredible Barry Nash. I thought was absolutely brilliant, and he's been brilliant all year, and probably doesn't get the mention too often compared to other lads. Like Sean Finn is incredible in the other corner, probably gets a bit more attention. I thought Barry Nash was absolutely immense yesterday. Um, and there was just so many performances and you nearly feel like it's a pity sometimes because Tony Kelly was so incredible that there were so many other great performances that were going on around him also but that was what was so great about this match though is anywhere the ball seemed to land there was just brilliant performances being put in around the pitch and you, you couldn't say enough for each player that played their part there yesterday you couldn't say enough for them yeah, Scal, the one thing I couldn't believe at one point, one or two people had put up on social media that Kelly was bottling some easy freeze and I'm there thinking Right, way you go back now and have a quick look at that sideline cut, which he puts over from the left hand side at an almost impossible angle. Oh, That's a guy who has all the bottle in the world who will do that for his team because the percentage play there would be you just play it back into space, Claire try and work one more attack, and you try and get into a decent shooting position. Yeah. But he knew he misses chances are Limerick are able to keep possession off their own puck out, and maybe you've lost the game. And we're and we're not talking about Tony Kelly's sideline cut. Then we're talking about Declan Hannon's shot from his own half. To win the game for Limerick, yeah. But the cojones are there for Kelly to go and actually take that on. And like, I think it's no bad thing if the freeze aren't happening. Duggan took the freeze pretty well when they switched around, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I like first of all to, to address that comment, of Tony Kelly bottle. Tony Kelly doesn't bottle anything, right? Uh, like that's that's shit talk as they call it. Mm. Like he uh, cojones is the word you use there. It's, fan, it's fantastic. Like Murph mentioned, that it, it was a greasy pitch, a wet ball. So the, the freeze he was taking, the difficulty in to keep the ball straight. You know, you know what it's like Murph. It's like just mm. when the ball gets really gets wet and gets greasy, it's it's a job in itself to keep it straight when it's in your hand. Never mind taking it for free. So there's mm. no such thing as bottling Tony Kelly. Like he, like he's. I, I'm going to say like he single handedly. You can nearly say dragged clear to the to extra time if you like. You know. That's the influence he has, has over the game. And he's just, he was immense, like, you know. And I, I actually struggled to, to understand who from Limerick was marking him. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know, like, who was marking him because, like, he, he was in so many uh, positions all over the pitch. And that's the that's kind of the exertion he put himself through. Like, he's just brilliant. Like, look, at, like, we could stay here talking about him all day. Like, but again, I have to just bring it back to, to, uh, to what Limerick did. Like, Limerick just grounded out and... Like they're absolutely exceptional, and like I, they are, I won't say on a par to say, with, but what they've achieved, like in three All Irelands, four Munster titles, and probably a league or two for this, this group of players, like since twenty eighteen, that's that's an exceptional record. So that that's that's rivaling what what she did more back in the early two thousands, like with Kilkenny. So where the team can go to, like the sky's the limit for them. Like I I'd say in that dressing room, obviously they're taking every day as it comes. You know that'll be the phrase they're using, but they're probably looking going. We can get five, six, seven Irelands here. Mm. No, it's unbelievable. Like I, I, again, I hate to make these direct comparisons between uh, that Kilkenny team of the Naughties and this Limerick team, but never be it happens because of the dominance the two teams yeah. had. Like I think it was fifteen was the record that Kilkenny went on in the mid two thousands. They won fifteen Leinster games in a row. Limerick are now unbeaten in fourteen in Munster, taking the draw into account that they had. Or sorry, fourteen championship matches now. If you take the All Ireland series into account as well, the draw against Clare. Like it just goes to show this Limerick team are getting into that level now where they're running off that many games yeah. that they've been unbeaten. It's a crazy, crazy record that they hold and they've shown now they can do it on a round robin year. They can do it in a non round robin year, bring the round robin back, they'll still win Munster and now they're directly into a semi final. I was just thinking, Murph, as well about Seamus Flanagan, because like we talk obviously about Kelly because he's all action and all the excitement and thirteen points and all seven from play. But eight points from Seamus Flanagan. I had a quick look back at the couple of games that they played so far this year and Flanagan didn't exactly light it up against Clare in either of those games but by golly he lit it up yesterday yeah and I don't think anybody saw it coming really like Seamus Flanagan on his day is an absolutely incredible player like when they went to win the All-Ireland 
Um, the first time, like he was, he was a fulcrum there at at full forward. He's really important. Maybe kind of struggled on and off for a little bit of form there. I suppose in this season more so. Obviously, the red card didn't help him earlier in the year. Was found himself on the bench for a little bit then again. But you know, I think all those things have probably put it into perspective for Seamus Flanagan. Like that, there's other players to step in here. You know, you make a silly decision or you don't perform on the day because this panel is so good. You know, potentially you won't get your place. But to come in and, and, and give eight points from play yesterday was absolutely an incredible shift. In any game, for any player to have eight points from play is a huge shift. Particularly, again, how close that match was yesterday, how physical it was, the very little space they had. He just managed to find the space. He managed to find just a little bit of time, a second for himself to look up and get a score. He was always off the shoulder supporting other players. And it was a huge shift. And, you know, in fairness to him, he, he deserves it. He deserves the credit because he probably got a fair rap now off, off the critics over the last while that maybe wasn't performing. Maybe, you know, question marks over, you know, would the red miss to send? Would he get sent off and different things? Um, particularly against this clear full back line who, you know, are fairly physical and like to mix it up off the ball as well. But... No, in fairness to Shams, like without those eight points, where were Limerick yesterday? In fairness, I know I know they would have had more players to come in, might have chipped in with three or four from play, and is what you're kind of expecting from any of the forwards. Three or four from play is an excellent shift, but eight is an absolutely enormous shift to put in. Um, and without him, I, I, you'd wonder that might have been the difference yesterday of maybe Claire just eking it out in normal time. But uh, incredible performance from him, and if he keeps this form, you know, there's no full back in the country will will keep him scoreless coming down the All-Ireland semi-final or the All-Ireland final if he keeps this form. And Scal, when it comes to the red mist, it brings us round to a bit of a conversation that happened on the Sunday game last night and they showed the instant where Hurley gets raked down the back of Flanagan at one point and there was a few instances along the way and, you know, Will O'Donoghue gets a bit of a dig and didn't go down and dive and Limerick showed a lot of discipline, I would say, in those kind of little niggly instances that they were highlighting. Yeah. But it was interesting that you had Dowling and Cummins talking about Clare's indiscipline when the narrative throughout the year was about you know getting at Limerick and Limerick were the team who were possibly being the aggressors in these situations. Um, what did you make of that bit of a chat from last night? Um, I think firstly Limerick probably understands what, what, what team's going to try and do. They're going to look for an edge. So I was very, let's say, happy to see that I don't know who and Seamus didn't go down. They didn't like feign injury. Didn't try to get card. So like. Credit to them, like, like nine tenths of players in today's game, like, will go down and try, you know, get an advantage for the team. So that's the first thing. But um, the Duggan, the Dug- look, there, there are two, there are two instances that I think if the ref catches them in real time. Now, Keane had a very good game, so that, I have to put that on record for, for, mm. for first and foremost. He had a very good game. He can't see everything, okay? But if if he sees it in real time, it probably is by the letter of the law a red for both. You know, Duggan's one was it a. Again, I'm trying to justify his, his action here. I can't really justify it, to be honest. <laughs> like it's, he, he punched him, like he punched him, but he punched him in the stomach at the dig more so than an actual full on belt. Like, but, but he is his one. There's no, I can't do anything there. Like, I can't say anything for him because he chops right down top of Flanagan, like he hit him down at the back of the hurl. So that's that's a wrong action, you know what I mean? And like, we've seen a couple of them over the course of the weekend whereby you're questioning what are lads thinking? Like, what, 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 when, like Rory's having a fantastic year, like, but if that's seen in real time, that's a red card, and there's no, and there's no defending it. I know, I know, the, the clear faith will, will probably say, "All right, he was probably being held or whatever." But that's just not. You can't justify that kind of action. So, like, whatever Flanagan did, can't draw that reaction off Rory, uh, who's who's probably been one along with Brian Nash has been the premier cornerback in the country at the moment. But I, th- I like Limerick, it was very noticeable when any kind of shamazel, if you want to like to call it, was about to start. They were. They'd, they'd front up, let's say, for a shoulder or two, but then they were getting themselves out of there. Like Hegarty was and Hayes were getting themselves out of there, and uh, it was good to see from their perspective. So they, I think, they've adapted to, to understand this is what teams are going to try, and they've uh, they're overcoming it. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing, Murph. They're learning that maybe there's going to be a bit of targeting. There's that feeling, and there's a definitely that narrative has been out there since the league. That you know, if you get at Limerick, and maybe if you kind of pull and drag at them or try and get them to do something we've talked about the dark arts of defending before and uh, what could happen this goes to show Limerick have maybe learned from some of their mistakes earlier this year yeah well they had to to be fair to them because you know they were kind of throwing away matches there at times with the red cars they were getting because when, when teams are throwing so much at you you need all 15 players on the pitch like that's that's just an obvious statement but like I, I huge respect like I've no vested interest in either team because look Clare and Limerick are going battling away I just want to see a great game whoever wins fair play 
Um, but part of me is there looking at it going, you know, some of the incidents, if this was Limerick, would Limerick be, you know, would we be sitting here today saying, how are Limerick still getting away with this? I'm sure they'd have people breathing down their neck, you know, Twitter would be an uproar over the whole thing. So it, the way I look at it is going, like, fair play to, to Willem O'Donoghue. Like, he took a box in the stomach and he just stared at Peter Duggan and just got on with it and didn't look for him to be sent off, you know. I think Limerick's attitude is probably, we're going to go out here on any given day we're not going to get any of the breaks like this is their mentality like as in their jobs you're saying we're not going to be given anything here we're also not going to go out and seek it we're not going to be throwing ourselves on the ground we're just going to go down and we're going to win it fair and square and we're going to just man up and take it on the chin and whatever this seems to be our attitude and there has been a little bit of a shift as well in terms of they're not reacting which is very hard thing to do as well because it, it, like they, they are in for a bit harder treatment than, than any other team in the championship, if I'm being honest. They are the lads that are being maybe a little bit more targeted because teams are looking to get under their skin and they have to deal with that. They look like they're dealing with it at the moment. But I, I'd, I've, you know, I, think, I think they deserve great credit for how they carried themselves over the weekend. That There was obviously a bit of needle in the match and there was a few incidents happened. They didn't react nor did they look for lads to be sent off or they were shouting at the referee. They just got on with it. So it's, it's, it's like, I mean, it's another area where they deserve credit. They get credit in every angle, but it's another area that, look, I, I hate when a team is getting unduly, I suppose, honed in on for how they carry themselves and, oh, they, they play dirty, they play on the edge and all this. Um, I think Limerick deserve credit at the moment that they're just, no one will be talking about them now this week saying they're filthy or whatever. Like, they're they're not. They're they're a manly team. They played it really well, and I just think they deserve huge huge credit that that they didn't maybe make more out of those incidents over the weekend. And Paul, when it comes to the refereeing, you know, Scales already mentioned, and again, I won't disagree with him here. I think Keenan had a really good game on a difficult day because you're trying to make decisions at a time when guys are slipping on a wet pitch, when there's a lot of obviously bunching up and rooks, and naturally players are going in to try and deny space. And it would have been easy to give a whole lot of more frees. And we could have had a free fest like there was in Crow Park on Saturday. But he allowed an awful lot to go, but in a very consistent way. He did, yeah. And I think that was recognised by the players as well that there wasn't there wasn't players turning around like okay every so often you see players asking what what the story was is free and that's kind of more of a knee-jerk reaction but in general he let the game go like you said on a wet night that's a very hard thing to do because players are slipping into each other there's a lot of accidental collisions the intensity from when the ball was thrown in i mean it was very obvious that you know there was going to be hurls flying around there was going to be shoulders going in mistimed and different things no intent but you know it was going to be a hard one to call but if, if he kept blowing freeze, we wouldn't have had the spectacle that we did yesterday. And again, the unfortunate thing about referees is they don't get the credit often when the games go really well. Um, and if he, I, think, I think he had a brilliant game. And I think, you know, he can be very proud of himself that he contributed massively to, to what we were served up because he let it go. He pulled it back when it needed to be pulled back. He used common sense and he just tried to keep, you know, keep the show on the road, not make it about him or anything. He was just going, right, keep this match flowing, keep it flowing. And because of that, there was great physicality in the game. And we love seeing it. We love seeing the physicality. But he knew how to call it with common sense, which was brilliant and fair play to him. So look, I'm sure all the headlines will be about, like we said, Tony Kelly and Limerick are a great team and so on. Um, but Keenan deserves great credit there in, in his own right. And he, he probably won't get it as much, of course he won't, as, as the players. But um, without him, this could have been a different match, being honest. It could have been a different match. And I think he, he deserves huge credit for it. James, what about one of the moments of the game then? We're 27 minutes in. Clare feel like they're on top. They've gone out, I think it was their biggest lead at the time. They were three points up at the stage. Seemed to be really on top of Limerick. Then, you know, a long enough ball comes down into Morrissey's hand and Hegarty just makes a break off the shoulder and finds the tiniest amount of space for the hand pass to be played to him. Looks like he's running into traffic. And then that beautiful scoop. A lot of people were saying it was a la kind of Gaza at Euro 96 with England and Scotland uh, with the way that he took the ball over the shoulder and still brought it down perfectly and then finished across goal remarkable skill from such a big physical man particularly in Hegarty's case to use minimum space and maximum skill to yeah. actually be able to get that shot away like just we'll rewind and just look at the clip where Morrissey catches the ball I actually think he catches the ball blind I think his helmet gets uh, the clips get unhooked and the helmet comes down over his eyes he catches the ball with the helmet down over his eyes like Jesus so and then he turns <laughs> and then that's the that's kind of the Limerick you know, motto go forward ball Morrissey turns straight away and somehow fixed his helmet in real time and then passes to Hegarty, like uh, who was had one thing in his mind. But yeah, yeah, you look at those goals, right? And it's like the finish, it's three points to the team, yeah. But the difficulty level in to do what Garage did, uh, it's actually hard to be quantified because 
Like that, Murphy, you meant, you meant, you touched on it a while ago. It's a millisecond, not even a microsecond, is what he has to actually make that decision to plan his route. Because obviously there's bodies all around him. And for him to kind of plan it, execute it, and execute it per- perfectly was just, it's, it's amazing. And it's one of those goals that I think, uh, one of those scores that like I often think of Kieran Carey's point, like for Limerick when he went off for midfield, it was at 96 or, or you know, uh, in the Munster Championship. And this is kind of the, the Hegarty goal is one of those scores that will be long in the memory like that was just exceptional but from an exceptional player and like the forward juniors as well in Limerick they scored 118 from play between them just for the forwards mm. that is ridiculous that's, that's, that's some return for a forward junior out, out of six and the two two boys who came in out of eight players like 118 terribly hard to stop but uh, look they just they just keep producing the magic well I would think Murph if you're declared defence there if that had been your old Kilkenny defence shaping up and how he gets the ball you're probably thinking you're in pretty good shape when he catches that hand pass because uh, you'd be tricks. almost you'd be almost assuming <laughs> That he's going to go north south. He is going to go straight through, and he's going to try and use his power. You probably wouldn't be expecting that moment of finesse to actually make the space. No, because he doesn't make it obvious that he's about to do it. And the scoop, I think, is important as well because if he actually flicks that ball, there's a a second that that ball is in the air where the clear defender can actually just look at it, judge it, and maybe just put the hurl up to spoil it a small bit. But the fact that he just scooped it over him at no stage did the ball really leave the hurl till it was just over the clear defender's head. So the clear defender, like that, he still thinks he's probably going to go for goal and then one step scoops it over his head as opposed to a blatant flick of the ball over the head. Everything about it, if, if one of those things went slightly wrong, he wasn't getting the goal. Like he, If he misjudged anything there, he wasn't getting through on goal. So like you said, yeah, if you were a defender going in, the defender's actually made the right decisions, really. All bar, you know, withstanding pulling down the fella. They, they tried to tackle, but Garrod Hegarty was just one step ahead of them in terms of knowing what they were going to do and creating a small bit of space for himself. But even going back to Tom Morrissey, when he caught the ball, this goes back to why it's so important in training and practising with lads off the shoulder. Like you were saying, James, the helmet came down over his head and he turned because he knew where goal was going to be, like as in the goal was. And he turned and instinctively, kind of a little bit of a glance, but he popped it to where he knew a Limerick player would be running. I don't know whether Garrod Hegarty called it or not. I don't know whether Tom Morrissey could even hear it with the atmosphere. But... Through being in the pitch and in training, knowing that Limerick will always have a player off the shoulder, as soon as Tom Morrissey caught it, he turned for goal knowing there's probably a Limerick player off the shoulder here now and I could pop it. And that in itself is something that's, if you get that into a team, it's lethal because when a player wins primary possession, if you know that there's a player around you somewhere, before you even look, that there's some player running off the shoulder and that a player has timed his run to make sure that they're there when you're turning to pop the pass. That's a huge thing to have in a team. And lots of teams try to do it and they don't get it right. So even that in itself just shows how, I suppose, how well the whole Limerick engine is taking over. It's really going well. So like, there's so many parts of it. For such a simple play, there's so many parts there that may appear simple and it's not. It was just, it, the whole thing there was a great, great goal. Yeah. Skell, when it comes to this Limerick defence, people probably have seen the picture of the sports file head up at this stage where they look more akin to a South African team on the verge of a World Cup as opposed to a team coming out of a, a pitch in Semple Stadium after lifting the cup for the Munster final. Um, particularly Sean Finn looks like the Hulk. Um, so like it's a very different body shape that cornerbacks and goalkeepers have right now, even looking at Nicky Quaid in the corner of the picture. But... They were able to use that muscle and the bit of pace that they have to actually shut down Clare's other forwards reasonably well. Because like you look down the scoring, after Tony Kelly, who's got 13, you're then looking at five points in play from David Fitzgerald. And as well as some of the other Clare forwards schemed at different times, like Shane O'Donnell didn't get the scores in play that he's been getting in recent games. Uh, Duggan was a bit more restricted than he's been in recent games too. In an overall sense, even if they didn't get a handle on Tony Kelly, I thought the Limerick defence did quite well on Clare in a general way. Yeah, they did. and like, Limerick defence would be, would, I think I, we'd always talk about their forward juniors, they'd always get the plaudits, but their defence is usually always rock solid, you know, from, from from one to seven and whoever comes in there. And like, I'm looking at Sean Finn in in that in particular in that photograph and he's built like a, a flanker in rugby, you know, so for him to be able to actually execute the way he, he executes, you know, with, with pace, he, he never gets burned for pace ever, you know, so for a man to be able to carry that, that weight, you know, that was just, he, he's, Looking at him, he could be ninety kilos with sort of the size of him. Like and he never gets burned. Like so, he's he's obviously a, a freak athlete. And then you got Barry Nash in the corner, who who was kind of a, a hybrid. He was in, predominantly in the forwards. Hannon started in the forwards. Like it's just they've got a really good unit, and like it's it's very similar to what Paul is saying about the forwards. That's kind of systematic. That's just pure trust. That's just repetition. That's been in training day in day out. That's been on the road for four and five years. This group together. It's the same with the backs. They're they're all it's like 
they're really telepathic at this stage, you know, they're just, and they can all range different positions. Like I, I mentioned previously about Morrison going out to wing back, like an all star full back going out to wing back, and just it's that adaptability. So, and they can play, I think, across the six positions too. So, predominantly, you see, always try, they'd always try to keep Hannon in the centre. You know, always and always, always forever. But I think the other guys, the other guys can move left. Like Nash can go to wing back. He can find himself in any part of the pitch, and you know the machine just keeps on ticking. Like so, that's the great platform. And you'll always hear with, with, with teams who win championships to say to say defense wins championships. Like so, if you're not scoring, like if you're not conceding big numbers, you'll always be in, you'll always be in the fight. Like and so, Nicky again another clean sheet yesterday. Defense didn't get opened up at all. They subdued Shane O'Donnell. Like Peter Duggan didn't relatively had a very quiet game from play. You know, they let Taylor do what he had to do out the middle of the field. So, so there was no huge threat there. And uh, like they, they just they're awesome. Like I'm running out of words, Will. <laughs> I'm mm. them, you know what I mean? I'm running out of words. They just I, I, I struggle to see who's gonna who's gonna stop them, genuinely. Especially when I see what was produced on Saturday night, the Leicester final. I, I don't know. And then you go into Crow Park, a larger pitch again. I, I know we're talking about the pitch sizes, but like Crow Park has been a very, very good hunting ground for Limerick. The last time they were beaten there was was Kilkenny, wasn't it? So, like mm-hmm. they're they're unbeaten there for a while. So it's going to be hard to see someone topping them. Yeah, no, it is. That's the million dollar question. Maybe the hope that neutrals have been given is that Clare have been so close in this year, Murph. But Clare's route to the final now, it, it doesn't open up too badly. They're on effectively what you could call almost the Leinster side of the drop because you're going to have if Wexford come through in their game against Kerry, it'll be Wexford against Clare again in a quarter final. Clare can probably take some solace that they have had the better of Wexford in recent seasons and then potentially they play Kilkenny, the Leinster champions in an All Ireland semi final. A lot of hurling to go, but Clare will feel that they've got every chance of beating those teams on that side of the draw. Yeah, of course they would. And uh, I don't see why they wouldn't feel that way. You know, going toe to toe with Limerick so many times now, there's no reason why they wouldn't feel that way. And I think, look, the way Clare look at this is they had a savage battle. They'd be disappointed that they lost the Munster final, but one more game, they're back into an All Ireland semi final. They're back exactly where they would have been if they wanted. So, look, they're obviously disappointed with just losing the Munster final. But in terms of looking at the Pats now, they're not looking at it going, God, we're after this, this is insurmountable. We can't, you know, this is going to be unachievable. Clare are really looking at it now going, okay, we need to go back at, the, go back at it here now. Um, you know, go at potentially Wexford, um, then Kilkenny if I, to get over the over Wexford, and you know they'll, they'll they'll look at Kilkenny over the last while, and I'm sure they'll feel that they have what it takes to beat them. Not to say that they will, but it, they, they'll certainly feel it when it gets to Crow Park. Um, the only thing that I suppose clear now, like that was the attrition in that rate, uh, the attrition rate in that match yesterday was huge, like in terms of bodies and all these different things and recovery now. So the one extra match, you know. We talked about it last week, how for Kilkenny and Galway, um, more so that, you know, having a week, an extra week off or a week or two off here is, is really important now because they're after coming through such a, a tough round robin phase. The same for Clare at the moment. If Clare picked up any niggles or injuries over the match yesterday, you know, the one extra match, that's the only place that the hindrance really comes in. But I'm sure Clare will be looking forward now, getting into a qualif- uh, quarter final and going, right, win this match, target an All-Ireland semi-final. We're in Crow Park. Clare performed well in Crow Park. And potentially an All Ireland final then after that. So I don't think the route now is, you know, is 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 very grim or anything for Clare. I think they'll be very positive about the whole thing. Yeah, we can hear now from both the managers from yesterday from off the ball. Oshin Langan was speaking uh, to both Brian Lone and to John Kiley. We'll hear from Brian Lone first, who uh, speaks about the fact that the period of the game which they kind of ruled was early in extra time where Limerick got a bit of a lead which they were able to hold on to and then you'll hear from John Kiley who spoke about how important this victory is for Limerick and the nature of the win as well I sure look obviously very disappointed um, that we weren't able to um, get the result um, very disappointed uh, for our supporters and all the people that supported us and very disappointed for for the team uh, they worked so hard and um, um, really uh, give everything uh, for the jersey and um, have been doing that consistently since we came back on the 8th of December. There must be an awful lot to take from it in the sense that your team did perform. I mean, they, they came up with a performance today. Yeah, well, look, you, you know, there's, you have no business coming down here. Like, it's, it's, it's a great place to play hurling. Um, hope against a really good opponent, really strong opponent. Um, and... Um, Look, unless you come down to perform, you'll be wiped out by those guys. Um, so uh, our guys perform, but look, just weren't able to um, uh, get ahead of them. I think an extra time, I think it was 8-4. What was the difference? Well, sure, look, I don't know. They, 
it kind of gave them a little bit of an easy start. Um, you know, they got two up um, straight away, and then we were chasing it a little bit after that. Um, so, look, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what exactly was the difference, but um, in the game of hurling, small things can have um, big effects and um, and big consequences. So, look, um, though over the whole game, we're, 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 we're very proud of our lads and uh, how they worked. Down but not out. In two weeks' time, you have another game. Yeah, we have another game. Like that's a, that's another proposition now. So we'll we'll just take that in and see how we go. Listen, it was a really tough battle, a really really tough battle, and it took everything that we had in the tank, you know, to, to try and get it across the line. And the game was right in the melting pot up until literally the last puck of the game. So, you know, all credit to Clare. They brought a massive challenge, uh, but all credit to our boys too, who you know trusted themselves, trusted the group. Uh, you know, our lads coming off the bench made a huge impact in the game today and I'm really, really proud of what they've contributed uh, in the build-up to the game and, and, and most importantly again today, uh, you know, when we needed them. So, yeah, fantastic achievement. Very honoured to be a part of the group or part of the group that would lift the, the, the Mackey Cup. It is obviously something that we would take great pride in, being the first team to lift that cup. You know, uh, a great family of, hur- of hurling people and obviously, you know, one of the iconic players in our history of, of GA and Nimerick so listen thrilled that he's been acknowledged in the way he is with the, the most championship being named after him which I think is a great honour for him and his family but more so for us today now for us to be able to lift that cup I think they'll take great pride in that as well Up until the 87th minute there was never more than three points between the teams and that was in the early stages what was the difference in extra time because that's where you, I won't say pulled away but that's where he got on top Yeah I think we were just a little bit more efficient you know and we were able to Get it, get it half a yard to get the shot off, you know. Whereas I think in, in our defence we were able to close them down and pressurise the shot, and we put a huge amount of pressure on their shots, and hence the, you know the, the, we forced the wides. Whereas up, up in our, our half the field we were able to still get a yard, get a half a yard to get the shot off, and I think that was the difference really. There's always a debate: are you better off having another game, or are you better off going the straight route? I imagine after a game like that, you'd nearly be glad of the rest. Listen, it's not going to be so much a rest, but I can tell you one thing, I'm damn glad that we're in a semi-final and I don't care if it's four weeks or 54 weeks, we'll manage it. We've been there before, we've a lot of experience in it and we'll have it on the ball, I can guarantee you. And just before I let you go, will Keane be OK for that or do you know yet? No idea. We'll have to wait and see, hopefully. Please God, he's doing well, he's doing well, but uh, he needs to be absolutely 100% before we'll, uh, we'll put him on the field. So that was Brian Lone and John Kiley speaking after the game with O'Shea Langan on off the ball. Uh, just at the end of John Kiley there, Skell, he's asked about Keane Lynch and like Keane Lynch, they've achieved this Munster title effectively without him since the second game when he went down with that hamstring injury. So they've had to find these solutions during the year and they had to you know find ways of winning without their best hurler. We kind of expect he's going to be back for the semi-final. John Kiley's playing his cards close to his chest saying we're not quite sure if he's going to be back. But they have a few weeks now to rehab that and get him back onto the pitch. And what a boost he'll be when he slots back in. Yeah, like I suppose if we spent the last half an hour kind of Lord and Clare and Limerick and particularly Limerick for what they've done and what they're able to do and they've done it without their best player. <laughs> you know, like it's ridiculous. <laughs> so he's going to come back in and slot straight in. Like, and like, Carl O'Neill has done well. He has mm. done well, to be fair to the fella. Like, he's, he's just a kid, like, you think about it. And he's, he's slotted into that system as well and, and hasn't had to skip to beat. You know, probably doesn't have the influence, obviously, that Keane Lynch has. So, like, when you get Keane Lynch back in and then have a Carl O'Neill to come in again, it just strengthens Limerick's case even further. Like, it's, 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 oh my God, it's frightening. But I, I'd say that the severity, I didn't realise actually Lynch's injury, injury was that severe because, like, with a hamstring, if it's bad you're probably back in you know five or six weeks but like when you're heading in towards the six seven eight weeks you know you're heading into a, a serious grade or a grade three tear or something like that so he's uh he's got a long road in front of him but like he's he's so good right that like it's like hard to see how how do limerick improve but like he is so good that when he comes back in they automatically go up five ten percent again you know that's how good he is like and he's he's just he's just a ball player like and he's I think if you if you were to go to any other county uh, around the country and check out their best player, for example, check out Tony Clare, Tony Kelly out of Clare, you know the Clare machine doesn't doesn't you know tick as well, for sure. Like you take out probably Conor Wheel out of Galway, definitely doesn't tick, anyways at all. So for Limerick to be able to produce the performances they're producing without Keane Lynch, like is is amazing. And so if he's available or not, I don't think John Kelly. I'm not going to say he won't care. Obviously, they still have a mission, but again, it's not going to stop the train.
Yeah. Murph, it's maybe easier to bring Keen Lynch back into the team than I just kind of talked to Peter Casey is almost back from his uh, cruciate ligament injury now. Very difficult to bring a player in, though, who hasn't played since All-Ireland Territory last year. He's been out for, you know, the best part of eight or nine months now. To try and bring him back into a team is almost impossible. But in Lynch's case, where he's so crucial to the system, and you would think that once he gets fit, he's going to be reasonably sharp anyway, it's much easier to fit Lynch back in than Casey at this stage. Yeah, it is. And even look, I mean, for, for Casey, you know, come back from a cruciate injury, there's an element of building your confidence back up again on the leg going into an actual match. That's a tough thing for any player I've, I've, I've talked to with cruciate injuries is, you know, going back into the rough and tumble of, of inter-county matches after having had an injury of a cruciate, it's it's not easy to do. Especially the fact that Keane Lynch has played a lot of games this year as well, you know, as in that counts for a lot um, okay, he has a hamstring injury, but there's a lot he can do to keep up a certain level of fitness as well. And then it may just take a week or two of getting back into full fitness after that. Like I don't, I don't doubt John Kiley that he's saying, you know, they don't know if they're going to have him because of the severity of the injury. Um, I would say, with the time now and the way that you know, I'm sure the excellent staff they have, the medical staff down there, I'm sure he's not too far off it, and he won't be too far off it for the semi final. But the other thing is, is that just does John Kiley have to start him? If there's a doubt, do you start him? Do you maybe hold off and introduce him later into the game if you know he has a half an hour in him or something like that? John Kiley has this to play with now, so he doesn't necessarily have to do anything silly if he, if you know, if he doesn't think Keane Lynch is fit. Because the bottom line is, unfortunately for Keane Lynch, he's missed a lot of championship games now this year. But for John Kiley and for Limerick, the most important thing was if you said, right, we have enough to win this Lynch or All Ireland semi final without Keane Lynch. That's what we think. Keane Lynch maybe isn't a hundred percent yet. The, if we have Keane Lynch for an All Ireland final, that'll be absolutely enormous, you know. And the main thing is Limerick winning the All Ireland this year. That's for John Kiley. The main thing is we win. So he just has to figure out here. There's no point in introducing Keane Lynch into this team if he's not 100. percent Even if he's 80, percent there's no point because they're going so well. And like James is saying, Carl O'Neill has done a great job there. He's not Keane Lynch, but he's a young man and he's done a great job. And he, you know, he he performed really well so far at centre forward. So. It'll be interesting to see. We, we, I think everybody wants to see Keane Lynch back on the pitch. But um, look, we, we, I suppose we can only cross our fingers now and hope that the injury comes right. But Peter Casey, you know, it's just the cruise ship now is a trickier one. And even if he does get back, he, he, he's lacking about a year of fitness as well. So it's just a tough situation for him. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, look, that's the Munster side of things and the Munster final that we've had. So now Limerick go directly to an All-Ireland semi-final as the champions. They've lifted uh, the new Mick Mackey Cup, which it felt kind of appropriate they would do so in the name of a Limerick legend after the game yesterday. Four-point win after extra time. And Clare now have got a week off to recuperate from that extra time in the very difficult game that they've had against Limerick. They put the feet up a little bit and watch Wexford against Kerry this coming weekend in a preliminary All-Ireland quarter-final and get ready for a quarter-final the week afterwards. And then the All-Ireland series going to kick on week after week pretty much after that it's an intense finish between now and the middle of July the Leinster final lacked intensity a little bit we'll see what the two guys thought they're still friends uh, on this Monday as we record the pod uh, which is good news after Kilkenny 22 points Galway 17 so three in a row for Kilkenny 74 titles overall 22 as a player and manager for Brian Cody 18 as a manager which is just an insane record really uh, he's now gone ahead of Wexford on the roll of honour so if basically if Brian Cody was a county by himself he would be in third place just behind Dublin and Kilkenny uh, with titles won but the disappointment might be from the way that Galway hurled so here's Henry Shefflin talking about the Galway performance and in many ways where it didn't work out for a team who were the narrow favourites going into the decider at Crow Park Disappointing result, but more so a very disappointing performance, and that's probably the thing that probably hurts the most. Because if you go out and you lose a big game and you, you perform to somewhat your capabilities, you wouldn't be too bad. But not to perform at all, it's very disappointing. So that's the probably one that's hurting the most. By half time, you were a point down. You had the win to come, and you looked in fairly decent shape at that stage. Yeah, but even the first half was just a very poor game, you know. I, I think for, for anyone, obviously Kenny are going to be the, the, the delighted, but for the neutral watching that game, it was just stop-start, never got any flow on it whatsoever. And, um, yeah, there was no pattern of play. We had no punch up front. Park Connor Whelan obviously was hurting him a little bit, but I said, yeah, it's just, it's just it's hard to put into words because we didn't see this one coming because we performed fairly well in the round robin you know uh, top to group probably should have even had all points and, and there was a good energy about us there was good work rate there was good intent in everything we did there was intensity all over the place and training has been good the last two weeks so uh, I definitely felt we'd get a performance would it be good enough I knew there was going to be a bounce in Kenny but um, yeah it just never happened and that's, that's the overriding emotion that disappointment 
So James Skell, that was your manager, Henry Shefflin, speaking after the game. You were, I think I used the word bullish last week about Galway's chances. You were very hopeful with the way that they had hurled in the Leinster Championship round robin. And then it just didn't really get going at Crow Park at the weekend, did it? Yeah, like, and like when we speak on this podcast, I, I try to base everything on you know, evidence. Like, so the evidence was showing that Galway were beaten. They came through the campaign pretty good stuff. Like, so you were saying their four juniors were beginning to tick. Their good players were playing well. And then the, then a performance like that on Saturday, you know. And I'd say from from Henry and the rest of the backroom team's perspective, that's the kind of thing that happens. Um, you try to keep it as rare as possible, where you just you're flabbergasted. You don't know where that came out of. Because I guarantee you, the energy in the training was good. You know, they had they had momentum. Uh, I'd say Everlad was in, was in good form personally, like on and off the pitch. So there was no reason to think that the performance was was not going to be given. And they just played very very poor, very bad. Like, I mean, horrendous. Like only two players, like Conor Whelan, I think, and maybe Brian Kennedy. Got scored multiple scores from play. Like we we're only five scores. It was a, it was an horrendous showing, you know. And it's like I, I I I what Henry said as well. I fully agree with like if you get beaten but you perform, you you nearly it softens the blow a small bit, you know. But when you get beaten, you don't perform at all. That 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 hurts way more because you're you're then you're at, you've you come away from the game with an awful lot more questions and answers. But like credit to Kenny, like they they won the tactical battle. They shortened up the game a bit. They, they played a different style than what they played against Wexford. Like uh, the likes of Richie Reid to say. You know, all the ball was short. Let's say it was methodical. It wasn't lumped and long. So and they just they just ground it out, and that's what they do. That's what I expect of Kikini all the time. Is they they'll grind and grind and grind it. So they'll always be in the fight. So you just have to fight more and open them up as best you can. And we didn't do that at all, at all. And it's a it's a damaging performance we like. And like they've got most likely, I'd imagine, obviously Cork to come through. We'd say, and mm-hmm. then to go if if they get over Cork, then go on to Limerick. So like they've got they've just made things an awful lot harder for themselves. You could say, you no, know, with yeah. respect to what's other side of the draw, but. Look, it's a long road ahead. No, it is. And then you look at some of the stats uh, during the game as well, James. You mentioned already the lack of scores around the pitch. So Conor Cooney gets nine points largely from dead balls. You've got Conor Whelan contributes four points from play. And look, he, he made it difficult at times for the Kilkenny defence, particularly in the first half. Then there was a lack of scores outside that. That's 13 out of the 17 accounted for just two players. You look at the shooting stats, they're not good. Like 17 scores from 36 in decent scoring range. That's a very poor turnover from a forward unit who were going yeah. well before this. That's the percentage though. So if we just touch on that for a second and put it into actual numbers. So the teams are operating now just below the 60 mark. That's where, that's where most teams, so if they have, let's say, 30 shots, let's say, for example, they're getting about 18 points. Around 60% is what they're getting, okay? Go away hit, as, as the stats show, 47%. So if you have a, a 10 point difference over the amount of shots that a team gets, that's automatically four points, you call it. With the average amount of shots that come in the game. So if you, were get, if you have an average probably of 40 shots, which most teams do, you're, you're four points behind straight away. Like, that's that's a cruel, cruel statistic. And But again, there was no rhythm. Like, I was looking, our, our midfield didn't play well. Like, Joseph Cooney touched the ball once in the second half. Like, we couldn't get, the ball didn't bounce for Tom Monaghan. You know, our subs didn't make an impact, to be honest. So you're kind of looking to see where could we have improved. And you can't narrow it to one spot. It's just so global. Like, we were just really, really poor. Um, but we were meant to be poor, if you, if you know what I'm saying. We were poor ourselves, right? But Kikini were very, very good in the tackle. You know, they're extremely good in the tackle, and our tackle was the complete opposite. Like we had, I can remember three instances like where we shouldered the fella into the head, like you know. So the man who was the ball, we shouldered him head, like what are you, what are you doing? Like hold him up, they say, and that just causes three frees, three yellow cards, you know, and the game gets break gets broken again. Um, and now the great, and like people are talking about the energy, of the crowd, yeah, but you have to give them something to shout about. You know, like you can't be just expecting the crowd to be roaring and shouting the whole time. Like Limerick and Clare gave the crowd something to shout about yesterday, but I don't think the crowd couldn't get involved. You could say, like on Saturday, and again, like we touch on the referee again. I thought the referee had a a bad performance. Like, so I thought there was cause that he should have let off. Like, and I know people would say, ah, by the letter of the law, but like Murph said it there a while ago about Keenan, common sense. You know, and I, I, we're not we're not being for blood here now, you know, but we want just a little bit of fluency. That's all we want. It's just the game to be a bit more fluid because it was a really hard spectacle. And I did tweet, is it the worst Leinster final in, in, in recent memory? And it is, in my opinion. Like, it's it was an extremely tough watch. I'd say great for, for, the result is great for Kikini people, but I don't think anyone in Kikini can say, like, hand on heart, that it was a good game. You know, great result for them, but I need the neutrals that say it was a bad game. So, look, it's not the greatest showing for Leinster at the moment. Yeah, Murph, you played in in my mind the worst Leinster final there has been before this one, which was twenty fourteen, which was the year that Kilkenny beat Dublin by double scores, and it really felt like that maybe you know that Dublin team who had won a Leinster title the year before was kind of coming to an end, and you guys gave them a good kick, and that was a very one sided final to watch as a neutral. I don't think there's been as bad a, um, a Leinster final since then. 
No, it probably hasn't. And I remember that one because I, I think the. I think I had one possession in that game in that Leinster final and I was marking I was marking either Paul Ryan or someone like that but we had a tactic going out that way in terms of what way we're going to set up about um, against Dublin and like if it didn't turn out to be pretty in the end now it wasn't a very negative tactic but we just kind of had their, their cards marked as to what, where we wanted to really target them and we just hit them with an intensity but the other side of it was was that it was a very one-sided game there was no real like I said in, I suppose an intensity from you know being a good battle uh, or a spectacle to watch um, and, and similarly enough then uh, yesterday or sorry Saturday evening it wasn't again but you know I was trying to figure out really why it wasn't you look at Limerick and Clare Clare knew they had to throw absolutely everything at uh, Limerick if they were to be in with any sort of a chance and, and the whole build up we were calling this last week saying this is going to be an absolutely incredible game now we weren't saying the same thing about Kilkenny and Galway hmm. the reason I think it wasn't a spectacle was because you know, Kilkenny would have looked at what happened in Pierce Stadium and said, right, well, where do we need to turn this around? And like, what was evident for me straight away was that uh, Park Mannion was sitting back. Now, I didn't think Fintan Burke was sitting back as far, but he was certainly sitting back a little bit. But Park Mannion was pretty much sitting on the 45. And I think Kilkenny looked at this and went, right, Richie Lahey, who that's a deliberate, uh, you know, I suppose, tactical change or a substitute that, start, well, he was started the game, but Richie Lahey wasn't really getting games up until now. So they obviously looked at Richie Lahey and said, we'll put him in in Park Mannion and get him to run up and down that line and potentially draw Park Mannion out of that area. But Park Mannion didn't come. So as a result then, Kilkenny were just striking long balls over the bar. So they weren't even having to bring the ball really into contact. So they're, like, whereas we were looking at the Limerick Clare game, where lads were forced to go into contact, forced to win a good ball, pop it out, you were getting tackled again. Kilkenny actually kind of sat back away from Galway and tried to draw Galway out in him. And then Galway didn't come up either. So Galway, there was a kind of a standoff really there. Like Paddy Deegan got two points down the left-hand side from distance. Like Adrian Mullins' point, I think, summed it up. Owen Murphy had a ball. He was standing in six-yard box for the puck out. He stood, looked out at Adrian Mullen uh, on the sideline, pucked it out to him. Adrian Mullen caught it and put it over the bar. I think Galway were after getting a score before that that they had to work really hard for. So for me, I was looking at that going, that just didn't make sense for me there that why Galway didn't just go, right, do you know what, we need to just step it up here and maybe, okay, risk exposing our backs in behind the full back line, but let's push up on Kilkenny here a small bit. Um, I thought what Kilkenny did really well as well was there was two kind of areas I think they really targeted. One was Mikey Butler was just following Cahill Mannion wherever he went. Now we talked about all year we've been talking about Cahill Mannion saying, you know, he makes Galway click when he goes towards around that centre back area, picks up the ball as it's coming out of defence and then sprays it into Connor Whelan or whatever. But Mikey Butler, who we're now starting to see is one of the stickiest, tigerish defenders at the moment. You love him. I love him, he's a great lad. But, like, I mean, he man the match yesterday, and what did he do? He just stayed fighting and fighting. He went off as a blood sub, came back on, smallest man in the pitch, caught a ball on the 21, but he was fighting the whole time. And the thing was, was he wasn't the man in the match in the first 30 minutes, we'll say, because he was just following Cahill Mannion, hounding him. And what happened then, Galway said, Cahill Mannion is getting no purchase out here, out the field. Get him back into the full forward line. And for me, I was going, happy days. Cahill Mannion's actually more dangerous out the field. And the other one then was... Tommy Monaghan. Tommy Monaghan has been hugely influential for Galway um, all through the year. But Kilkenny then introduced Conor Fogarty into the middle. And something that Conor Fogarty does that's it's hard for the untrained eye, I think, to see it, is that how much he breaks up the game in terms of stopping Galway from winning the ball. Like We'll all look and we'll look at TJ's great catches or, or Conor Whelan's great points. But Conor Fogarty gets into the mix there and he just wins the ball and pops it out. And it's not glamorous stuff, but... What kind of an influence did Tommy Monaghan have on the game yesterday? I know James, you were saying the ball didn't maybe break from. I don't think the ball was allowed to break from because Kilkenny were just looking at him going, he's, he's dangerous up that wing and if we give him the space, he'll be really dangerous. But you look at it in the first half where he won a ball and he was forced to go back to his own 45 to win a ball and straight away Kilkenny swarmed him to break it up. Adrian Mullen gets a point off it. So I think they just got their matchups really right. And it was a very flat game, but going back to what you were saying, Will, about 2014, you don't care as long as you just win the match. You're into an All-Ireland semi-final. It's not glamorous. You know, you're, they're, they're not going to be talking about this game for years to come. But I think Kilkenny are happy now that, OK, we'll give up Pierce Stadium. We lost that one. But if it meant getting everything right for this game, happy days. So, look, it wasn't a glamorous game by any means. But Kilkenny people or, or the Kilkenny team won't mind that. Murph, to that point, and again, as a defender, you're going to take a lot of pleasure from this. Galway in the last kind of half an hour of the game, I think it's a 31-minute spell, they only managed to score six points and only one of them came from play. Like, that's a really good lockdown when the game was actually in the balance. 
Yeah, really good lockdown. And I, I think Galway just kind of maybe ran out of ideas as to where they were going to be getting scores from. And like James pointed out there that they only converted 47%. When you think of some of the ones that they left behind them, like Conor Cooney, 65. Look, 65, okay, they don't always go over, but like TJ Reid was knocking them over at the other end. They're important scores to get. And there just seemed to be as well for Galway, a few wides crept in coming down the home straight there that... I suppose galvanised Kilkenny that Kilkenny were going it's great to see them ones going wide you know when you're a defender and someone gets a shot and you're praying that it goes wide and it does go wide it, it, that's a great thing for defence and then Kilkenny started to come out with a few balls I think then the Galway crowd were getting a little bit kind of angst with the referee because Kilkenny probably got a few frees then that you know could have went either way which also helped Kilkenny as well like there was a few free outs there that we got actually again Mikey Butler won one where I think Jason Flynn could have been tripped or someone like that Richie Reid was going back I've seen him given as free ins but that kind of fed into Kilkenny's momentum then that they were getting the breaks just when they needed to be getting the breaks. Galway hit the few wides. And then, significantly enough, the likes of Park Welch coming on, John Donnelly coming on, Walter Welch, they had a great influence. Like, even the last score, or the second last score there that John Donnelly catches it, pops it off to Park Welch over the bar. Like, coming down that home straight, Kilkenny just kicked on. And like you said, for a defence it was great because they just seemed to come out with those balls at the really important times. And that lifts, that lifts everyone on the pitch. When you see 10 minutes to go, 5 minutes to go, and your backs are coming out with balls or the win and freeze out. That's enormous. You know, that's nearly worth the score on the board as well. So it was really satisfying from where I was sitting, seeing how the defence was finishing the game, that they were finishing so strong and really using the ball really well, which was a lot different to how they played against Wexford. Yeah. Scale, did that add to your frustration a little bit? Because you were saying about you weren't entirely happy with the way that James Owen had, had officiated the game. That at a time when Galway were trying to get a little bit closer, it seemed a free would be conceded, TJ pops yeah. it over. It was like a very familiar story about that last half hour, really. Yeah, like, I, I don't think we could build any bit of rhythm at all. Like So when you're trying to, especially when you're when you're behind, you're trying to, I suppose, up the pace of the game, you know, and try to tack on as many scores as possible, get into a bit of rhythm, see can you find a pattern of play that's actually, that will actually work for you, because up to that point, nothing was working for Galway at all. Um, but like, I just had so many questions and, you know, it, it, you could feel you could feel as well. Again, we're talking about the crowds, but um, I thought Owens was was really poor, too finicky. Um, I and I came away. I know it's this is petty now on my behalf, but how come there was a Leinster ref doing the Munster final and there wasn't the Munster ref doing the Leinster final? That's where my head was going, like you know, just trying to clutch the straws here. But uh, it's just look, I, I'm not taking anything away from the performance, like or from Kilkenny because they won the game. I say they played the game that was put in front of them and they they adapted to James Owens just like oh, we should have done, you know, or like. So credit where credit is due. Um, but I was just, as I said to you at the start, I had so many questions with, with for Galway um, and questioned, did, did they actually want to win the Leinster? Do you know what I'm saying? Like you look at, I look at the way Kikini celebrated. I look at the way Limerick celebrated their Munster, right? Did, did Galway actually want to win the Leinster? Do you know, or were they treating it as just another game, another stepping stone? That's a, that's a question I have. Our puck out strategy, what is it like? Do you know, what's our puck out strategy like? We hit 90% of our puck outs down the same wing in the first half and I'm wondering what's going on because we're not winning them. You know, I don't know what the strategy is. They're too slow. Pokos are too slow. It allows the team set up. So we can't get a bit of a foothold in the game at all. And then you saw the Wexford game, which is the one blip you could say we had in the round robin, whereby when the game became a bit frantic, same thing. All the Pokos down the one side. Kept going down the one side and it became very, very lethargic. It became very kind of overly structured. That the, the Just can on that puck out point, Skell, you've brought this up a few times. Like we talked about Galway and how the puck outs didn't work particularly well. I think going right back to the Wexford game away from home, like we've been talking about it that long. That's the one, yeah. There's been like nearly two months to try and rectify it. And I'm sure this is something that's worked on a lot in training. Why have Galway not been able to speed up the puck out or have a bit more variety to it? Um, the only thing I can say is that it's if 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 Aina is like taking eight, nine, ten seconds to work out, I think it's structured. I think it's probably a part of their game plan. You know, mm. I think what they're trying to do is overload one wing, make it a battle, and then spread it open. But it's just it's not working to the kind of the effect that they're, they're after. Um, and there's no real variance to the ball. I see. I'm looking at the Kikini puck out. Kikini, I think, got 11 out of 11 inside their own 65. So they hit 11 targets inside their own 65. Not just the handy one to their full back now. But they got eleven off into the sixty-five. Go, we got two. You know, and so if you were, if if I'm a, ke- a keeper and I'm trying to kind of pull out the Kenny defence, which is what I want. I want Kenny defence to come out. I don't want them to go back. I don't want them to pack up our forwards. I want them to to create. Uh, I want to create a big pitch up up that side and, uh, and create a small pitch our side. The only way I do it is if I draw them out with sharp pokeouts or draw them out with kind of mid-range pokeouts, which is anything inside your sixty-five. We didn't do that, so Kenny go right. This ball's coming along. Let's just sit back and pack it out. That's exactly what happened. And like, you see then how hard Conor Whelan had to work for his points. My God, like he put in a great performance, let's say, but he finished with the same tally as Adrian Muller. 
And look how, I won't say easy, I'll say easier Adrian Mullen had it when he shooting freeze points. You know, so, and I think the game, especially in Hurling, it's huge. The puck out game is, if you can win the puck out strategy or you can win that that kind of f- faster play, you're on, a, you're on a, a long, long way to win the game because then you're actually managing the game. You're managing the pace of the game. You're managing where the ball is going. You're in full control of it. And just, we're, we're stuttering, stuttering big time in that department. Mm. Paul, it's not puck outs that Kilkenny got right in this case, but definitely their approach was, um, let's say, less reliant on the longer ball as we saw in the Wexford game. So Kilkenny obviously learned from that. I mean, I think it was uh, our good friend at No Plan B, GAA, uh, stuck up just literally before we were about to record. Um, he stuck up the stats from Richie Reid and the distribution which he put in at Crow Park on the weekend just gone by. I like, when you look at it, Murph, it's very different uh, to the amount of times that he launched longer ball up into the opposition 45 in the Wexford game. He has got a lot of green marks on his passes this week. And they're basically sprayed all over the place. So clearly, Richie Reid has used the ball an awful lot better. So and in a more general sense, Kilkenny have used the ball in a better way. What, what are the numbers there now? So we're looking at the possessions here. So we've got two beside each other, which are about possessions retained. So he had 19 possessions, Richie Reid, against Wexford. Only 10 of them were retained, and he gave away the ball nine times. In the Galway game, he made 15 out of 18 from his possessions and only lost possession three times. Like That's, that's clearly... A better picking better passes yeah. and also executing the better at the same time too yeah absolutely and like that just comes from it, it, it's clear to see for me there anyway that for some reason it was a plan against Wexford to actually strike a lot longer balls because you can't just turn this on overnight and go okay now we're passing short it doesn't work like that like Kilkenny are I suppose they maybe took a little bit longer to come to the party in terms of actually working this short passing but they have it in their locker and they can do it. I mean, they showed it the weekend, they've showed it many matches, they can do it. But for me then, that why it happened against Wexford is they were obviously said, listen, we are going to strike balls. And the thing is, in or we're going to strike long balls. And in a game, it's very hard to go back on that, to get that message to the pitch that, because you need your players to come looking for it. You need your half forward line to come short. You need your midfielders to come short. You know, it's what we talked about last week, the likes of Adrian Mullen being too far from goal, out around midfield and so on. But you need lads to come and have a look for it around the half forward line. And there was there was always someone there available. And when they weren't available, we actually saw Kenny recycling it, going back across the line, going back to Owen Murphy. Owen Murphy had spread out the other side, maybe to Paddy Deegan or to uh, Tommy Welch or whoever. So the, the thing was, was that not only were they looking for the pass and looking to work it and look to run through Galway, as in pop the pass, take it on, break the tackle, pop it again, they were actually going, well, okay, when it's not on, bring it back around, give it back to Hugh Lawler, bring it back to Owen Murphy and launch it from there. So it was, yeah, like, I mean, a complete change from the Wexford game. But that just, like I said, that just goes to show me that they didn't just suddenly learn this in, in two weeks. This was something that they always had, but for some reason against Wexford, they, they weren't able to adapt their game once it wasn't working against Wexford. So, yeah, the, the stats there speak for themselves. And Richie Reid had an enormous game yesterday as well, in fairness to him. Like, 18 possessions is huge in a game. So, um, it, great to see, I suppose, a real steady performance there in terms of the use of the ball yesterday. And, again, only for it, I, I think Galway would have won the game. Like, I mean, if you're feeding balls down on top of McInerney, if you're feeding them down on, on top of Davy Burke, like we saw Davy Burke, he had a, or, or Dahi Burke, he had a savage game as well, actually, the weekend, and he fielded a huge amount of balls. So, if you're going to field ball down on top of them, you know, it's like nuts to a monkey. They'll just take it and that's it. So, it's, uh, it, there was only one way Kilkenny could do it at the weekend, and, and it was great to see the great use of the ball. Scale, when it comes to Richie Reid then, I have to bring you back to an incident again that was highlighted on the Sunday game by Jackie Tyrrell, and that was Fahey's stamp on him when he was prone on the ground. Yeah, I think if the officials see that correctly, that would have been a red card. Yeah, I, I again, I don't condone that at all. I'd say that's 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 a red card, you know. And I, and again, like Keenan's, a, he's a, he's a, an awful sound kind of quiet fella, so it's completely out of character, like for him to kind of do that. So I'm wondering why. What was in his head, you know, I, I, I was saying to myself, if the ball was kind of loose or whatever, maybe you can justify the action, but the ball wasn't loose, the man was down injured, as Murphy said, he, he received a kind of a head injury, like, so it's, it could be serious or semi-serious, just move on, so I don't know what that's, that was about, rush blood to the head, if the ref sees it, it's a red card all day long, yeah, shouldn't happen, can't happen, shouldn't be done. Right, small matter then, of handshake gate 2.0. I really thought when we spoke last week, this wasn't even going to be an issue. I thought the game would finish. Two lads would walk over to each other. A handshake would happen because they're both aware that everyone's been talking about it in the week leading up to the game. It was going to be a, a handshake and maybe even a pat around the back between Shefflin and Cody and life would move on irrespective of the result. Kilkenny had this game won with about seven or eight minutes to go. 
So Brian Cody will have known going up towards the end of the game, as much as focus would have been what's happening between the white lines, that a handshake was going to happen or he was going to have an interaction with Henry Shefflin. We all kind of wait to see what would happen. There was a long period on the pitch before the presentation where Henry Shefflin was walking around. He shook hands with some of the Kilkenny backroom team. I think he worked his way over to some of his club mates and shook hands with some of the Valley Hale players. He then actively had to seek out Brian Cody. Brian Cody's feet were stuck on the ground in Crow Park. He was not moving over towards Henry Shefflin. Shefflin had to make his way all the way over. It was a reasonably cold handshake. And then the TV cameras caught Henry Shefflin shaking his head for about six or seven paces as he walked back over towards his management team. Skell, to me, as a neutral, we'll get Murph's take on it now in a second because he's caught beautifully between two stools here. It didn't look good. <laughs> and I don't think that's what's hyping it up, Skell. I think it didn't look good. Uh, it, no, it didn't. Right? I, I look, and people will say that I'm trying to deflect away from the performance. I'm not. So first and foremost, the performance is cat, right? But, like, I, I just can't get around the fact that, like, Henry won 10 hours to this man, like, or it was a, was a large part of him 10 hours to this man. Go over and shake his hand, right? Just go over and shake his hand. Put it to bed. You have you have you have full control of this now. You can put all this to bed and cr- all this hysteria, all this media talk. Just put it to bed. Go over and shake his hand. And just be like, you need to be gracious in, when you win, like you know what I mean. You need to be kind of humble when you win and like, just park it up. Let's say. So I was extremely, extremely, extremely disappointed with that. We had to go <laughs> go through the whole thing again. I thought it was going to be dead and buried. Like, I thought they were just going to shake hands, move on, on to the next, but it didn't happen. And. Uh, Look, for what he's done in the game with, say, Brian Cody and like what he's produced over the years, we just mentioned 22 Leinster titles say, as a player and manager. Um, he can do an awful lot better than that, to be honest. You know, And I know, this, I'm not saying anything about him as a person, because like, I, I, from what I gather, like, he's a pure gentleman off the pitch to, to, to other clubs and people and doing functions, etc. But this instant, this particular instant, just go over, put it to bed, shake the man's hand and move on. Didn't happen. Disappointing. Yeah. This guy's a multiple winner, right? So again, I'm not questioning Cody here, but I just think, Skell, that... The traditional thing to do when you are the winning manager particularly, and Martin Kiley pointed this out about John Kiley. He was, uh, Martin Kiley was in the game for Radio 1 for the Munster final. And when John Kiley came over to talk to the media afterwards, he made a point to saying, lads, I'll be back in a minute. I just want to go over and find Brian Lowen and shake his hand before I come back. And I, I think that, that was not to do with Cody and Shefflin, but it just goes to show that John Kiley's first instinct after being mobbed by the Limerick fans coming onto the pitch was to go and find Brian Lowen and his management team, have a quick chat, shake the hand. It's what the winning manager yeah. does. That, that, that is just what a winning manager should do. And actually, yeah. that's exactly what Shefflin did scale back in Salt Hill. It was actually Shefflin who made the way over to Cody to shake his hand because Cody was making his way on that occasion to talk to the referee. Yeah, like what Kiley said and did, like I think it's the highest degree of sportsmanship. Like, you know... And it's it's very easy, you know, to, to get caught up in the hysteria after winning such a big game, let's say. But what the 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 right thing to do and the smart thing to do is is like that is just be be very humble when you when you win and go over and commiserate with the with the losing team. Um, and like that's what Henry did in goal. Like he went over and uh, uh, seek seeked him out, initiated the whole thing again. And like there's no question about it. I don't I don't care what anybody says. And this just proved it, right. I I just do think Brian is extremely disappointed in Henry coming up to Galway. You know, like that we're direct competitors to Kilkenny. I don't see it being such an issue if Henry went to Cork, you know, <laughs> where, where they're not going to be meeting the Leinster Championship, right? So that's a bit of a part to play in it too. So I, and I, that's my position and I'm not moving from it. <laughs> okay. Right, so basically Scale's not moving in the same way that Cody didn't want to move from his position when he saw Henry <laughs> Shefflin walking to him. Yeah. Murph, look, you've played alongside Henry Shefflin. You've worked for many years under Brian Cody. You've got an experience of both men. You know them better than Scale and I know them. What was your take on what happened? Because you you were in the stadium, and I'm guessing you didn't see the handshake actually happen in real time then. Uh, no, yeah. So we were walking around. We were going to head out or head around to the Hogan stand side, and as we we're walking around, um, the lad I was with just said, "Oh, they're after going over and shaking hands there." And I heard a bit of a cheer, and I was going, "Oh, that's grand, so it's done. Happy days." At least they went over and shook hands. And next thing on the way home, I saw it trending on Twitter, and I was going, oh, "What's what's this about now?" And obviously, I saw what I saw. So at the time, I didn't see. What everyone else saw, but um, yeah, look. To be honest, I was just I was disappointed. Like you know, I was just disappointed in the whole thing that everything could have been just put to bed as soon as the final whistle was blown. Go down, shake hands, and that's it. Done. Everybody, actually, a lot of people lose interest in what happened in Pierce Stadium because they think they misunderstood it or whatever. 
But just the way it played out, you know, there was a conscious effort not to be the at least I suppose to put it best way, there was conscious effort to at least not be the first person to initiate the handshake there. Like not that he wasn't going to go and shake hands with him, but he obviously went and shook hands with every other player and and, and stood there. And you know, for me anyway, like, you know, soldiering with Henry for so many years, Brian was my manager for so many years. You know, I was disappointed I was disappointed for Henry, to be honest, because I was just going, Look at the man <laughs> the man has been like he won his first All Ireland when I was about ten years of age. I, I wear a green helmet because Henry Shefflin wears a green helmet, you know. So I was disappointed that Henry maybe felt aggrieved in that situation. And I think a lot of Kilkenny people also feel the same because you know Henry is Henry, like you know, and and he will always be that way to Kilkenny people. So I would, look, I was disappointed, but at the same time, I think I kind of just went right. Maybe that is it, put to bed, and it's not a good way to finish it up. But hopefully, I kind of nearly wanted just to finish up now that we're not constantly going back to this because. It's not good for either side to be kind of going back and forth of what, where do we stand now? What, what is the situation? But look, I was, I was disappointed in it, um, and like I'm not going to be standing saying that, oh, it was, there, it was a lovely handshake. It wasn't like you know, it was, it was a handshake, and fair play to Henry for going up and initiating it. But um, yeah, look, not the, not the ideal way we, we wanted. Everybody wanted it to finish in terms of just putting it to bed. But look, it was what it was. He's. Shaking his head as he walks away, I think having had a couple of days now to think about it, because his mentor is not embracing him or maybe showing the respect that he expected. I don't think in that very short exchange there's anything said between Cody and Shefflin that's annoyed him. I think he's just annoyed about the fact that he actually had to go and seek Cody out. Yeah, I don't think there was anything said. I mean, it was... You could just see Henry went up and probably just said, congratulations, Brian, well done. Maybe something, it, it, you couldn't say any more than that. Um, but yeah, like you said, it was just the way it played out. I don't think there was anything said. And I, look, I don't, I don't think Brian even said anything either. But it was just that. It was that that he had to go and walk. And Brian obviously could see where Henry was as well. But it was just the fact that Henry had to go walk and shake hands that... You know, look, I'm sure Henry would have appreciated after the whole, you know, the madness of in the papers and all the media after the Pierce Stadium game that he would have appreciated him or Brian coming down and just shaking hands with him and saying, well done, you know, water under the bridge, let's carry on. But the fact that Henry had to be the fella again to go and initiate the handshake, I think that's, like you said, why he was shaking his head when he was walking back. Brian Cody said, and I'll play a bit of audio from his chat with Asher Riley on OTB on Saturday evening in a moment, but Brian said he didn't want to be the story. Uh, when they did the press conference afterwards and that was kind of the way he addressed it he was like it's about my team it's about my players we just won a Leinster title I don't want to talk about the whole handshake thing but again does he not kind of he could have easily not been the story if he had just gone over and shook Henry's hand yeah well that's it I mean like if, if you if you think about it for two minutes to yourself you know, in the run into the game, thinking what's the best way we could do this is shake hands before the game, shake hands mm. after the game, whatever. You know what you're going to do in that situation. So, like you said, if you just want to throw water on the bonfire, it's just a case of walk down, shake hands, and then suddenly everyone's going, ah, that, that was a thing in Austin, that was a storm in a teacup. But, like you said, yeah, it's you're contradicting yourself by saying it. If you're not going and shaking his hand, but yet you're saying you don't want to make a big deal of it. It's it doesn't make sense that way. So yeah, look again. Look, Brian. Brian, in fairness, we all know that Brian conducts himself in interviews. You know, he does like to dispel this and that there's anything other than this is a game to be won and we're here to win a game. So to be fair to Brian, that's the way he talks anyway. Like you know, and he doesn't like to say anything in an interview that may be carried over for weeks on end or that may come back to be a distraction coming into an All Ireland semi final. Um, but yeah, look, I think we've, we we definitely hit the nail on the head there by just saying if if you want to get rid of it, just go down, walk down the line in the final whistle, and you know, and, and and the match didn't even finish in a hectic way either. Like you know, Kilkenny had it won, so you had your time to plan it and go down and shake his hand and just finish it up. But um, yeah, I think if you wanted to dispel it, that's the way you do it. Yeah, I was willing to understand it as a little bit of a heat of the moment thing in Salt Hill because of the lay free, because of the nature of the defeat. This time round, Kilkenny had won. Like, uh, like Cody has the higher ground before he walks across, and there's no problem doing that. W- one last question, Murph, on this. Do you kind of come round to Scale's way of thinking now that Cody definitely has some resentment towards the fact that Shefflin has gone to Galway then? Yeah, maybe so. I don't know, to be honest. I know Henry has been asked into the Kilkenny setup um, uh, on previous occasions. How many times? I don't know. Or was it just once? I'm not sure. 
but um, yeah maybe Hen- maybe Brian was a bit disappointed over it I don't know I mean certainly it's not a conversation I'll, I'll, I'll ever have with Brian or I'm sure m- not a lot of people will um, maybe he was disappointed because you know obviously they had been through a lot as, as a manager and player and won great All-Irelands over the years and maybe he thought that geez if Henry comes in here he'll do a lot for the younger lads and so on And but then Henry has his own plans and I think you just have to respect that like you have to just mm. whatever a lad wants to do it's, it's not personal it's just business like you know you want to go and be a manager yourself you want to stand alone you want to do your own thing like the reason Henry was such a standalone great player was because he relied on himself quite a lot of the time in terms of preparing himself he had his own way of viewing games he had his own way of training in terms of off the pitch and conducting himself like he's his own man so I think he very much wants to put his own spin on management and maybe Brian just feels that Look, he would have at least appreciated the help over the few years inside in the camp but again that's for me it's speculation though as well because we don't know no there is no indication there but you could understand like James when James is saying that you can understand where he's coming from by saying it because like there, there's a small bit of an needle there and it has to come from somewhere you know yeah that needle was definitely there post game by the way I, I promise you this is not just the media uh, deciding to latch on to something and try and make something out of it first time around I thought the reaction was maybe a little bit over the top and sure look we talked about it for about half an hour in the pod so we're as guilty as anyone but when you have what we're just about to hear now which is when Brian Cody spoke to Ash O'Reilly after the game now this happened not too long after the handshake and as you can probably appreciate Ashling was already down in the tunnel area waiting for the manager so she hadn't actually seen the physical handshake take place during the presentation but she asked about essentially the vibe between Cody and Shefflin after the game and this is what Brian Cody had to say I have to ask you about Henry Shefflin uh, there's a lot of talk about it at the minute are we reading into it too much or is there anything in it? Look, all I know is we're playing Galway tonight. It's got on. I mean, I don't consider myself the most important person out there by a long shot. So I only talk about our team and the opposition players. Who's looking after either team? To me, is is of not of no concern whatsoever. Did you just end up uh, shaking hands and embracing after the game? Look, I tell you what, we will talk about the players and the team, and that's it. Right, so that was Brian Cody uh, speaking to Ashton O'Reilly. Make up your own mind, by all means, bombard the comments underneath the YouTube video or send us a tweet at the Hurling Pod and uh, give us your thoughts on Handshake 2.0. Will we see Handshake 3.0? Is there a chance, uh, despite how good Claire and Limerick were at the weekend of Galway and Kilkenny meeting again in an All-Ireland final? We had the lower tier finals come to a close scale at the weekend too. What a Joe McDonough Cup final. Uh, the Munster final link just about lived up to this, but hard to do so because it was so entertaining between Antrim and Kerry. This is a game where Antrim were ahead uh, 12 points up after 25 minutes. They were 11 points up, I think, after the fourth goal went in early enough in the Forty, second half. Minutes, yeah. Then the goals dry up a little bit and the scores dry up a bit for Antrim. And Kerry, very much inspired by Podge Boyle, who got two goals and 11 points during the game. Also Jordan Conway coming off the bench scoring two yeah. goals. Get right back into the game. In the end, it finishes 522 to 424. You're getting nearly a score every few minutes in this game with the way that it went. Yeah. And Kerry can probably feel a little bit disappointed and aggrieved that there was a soft free given the second last score of the game for Antrim. And then maybe they could have actually forced this game into extra time in a game where they were so far behind on two different points. What a wacky but brilliant Joe McDonough Cup final we had. Yeah, like I, I, you mentioned the fourth goal there, Will. I think it was around the 40-odd minute uh, in, the, in the second half, and there was 11-point 11, 11 separation. And next thing, the, it's, just, it's actually hard to, to actually contemplate how did Kerry get themselves back into it? Because next thing, he was, oh, they're nine down. You wouldn't see. Now they're six down. They're five down. And just they kept plugging and plugging and plugging, and the defence got on top. And in fair, like, with respect, they missed a couple of frees too in that, in that period, let's say, when they were three down to two down. They missed one or two frees that, that you consider easier, let's say, than what... Than some of the scores by got during the game, but I was looking at Kerry like they pulled out Shane Conway, uh, a good move, and they put Jordan inside, kind of as kind of a Roman front forward. Say. But then, when they got within kind of touching distance of, of Antrim, like two or three, they pulled Jordan Conway out. Like I, I couldn't understand what they were doing there because he was creating havoc inside there. Like, he rattled two, was it two two he got? Two two off the bench, yeah. Like that's that's some contribution for a sub. Like and it's, it's, it seemed like every time he got the ball, he had one particular thing in his mind that was trying to orchestrate a score, obviously, but try try rattle the net, like but. Again, Antrim grounded out, and at one point is the, is, the, is the separation between the two teams. Probably was a couple of more more points. You think about it over the course of the game, but uh, they'd be happy to come away, and they just they just just about came away. But Kerry's effort, excellent. And I was saying after the game, you know, I think like I don't want to try and dilute the Munster Championship. That's what some people are saying. That I'm, I, that, that's what will happen when Kerry don't come into. But I think like they've been in the last three Metro Cup finals, have they? Yeah, lost twice to Antrim now, once to West Media. You know, like I know, I know they've lost them, right? And that's fair enough. They've lost them, right? But they still deserve a shot, Monster. Give them for a trial period, maybe for two years, and see how they get on. If they 
carriers themselves, let's say, effectively make it a more permanent fixture. But I think I think they have to go in. I think there has to be some sort of accountability on, on behalf of Munster GA to include a county in their own province. That's what I just can't stop, stop laughing at. Like, you know, it's not like us going into Leinster, like where, whereby there was, I suppose, it was a bit tension of some, some of the member counties. Kerry are from Flipper Munster. Will you put them into the championship and give them a shot? Like, you know. And uh, and one one more word for, for Antrim, the penalty. Uh, oh. It was a Clark's penalty. The best yeah. penalty in memory. I, I can't remember any, anyone better. What a penalty. Yeah. The, t- the two penalties in that game literally went into the top corner. Like, they hit the sanction, they were so top corner. Unbelievable. Like, it's the best penalty I've seen. Mm. So that was Kieran Clark 2-2. Uh, Conal Cunning got one ten during the game for Antrim. So <clears throat> yeah. we're not talking about an Antrim team who in recent years have been inspired by Neil McManus. It was... Uh, yeah, two points is all he got. When yeah. all he got to say. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, small, <laughs> small, con- small contribution. But hey. He's normally getting 10-12 you know, over the course of the years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this Antrim team, Murph, when you look at it, I don't know if you got in to see the tail end of it before you got in for the Kilkenny game, but they got 25 goals across the six games, five goals in the final. They'll probably feel that they just about got over the line in the end with the way the game finished, but the scoring that these lads have done, the Saffrons, during the Joe McDonough has been ridiculous. Yeah, like, I mean, any, any of the, the games we watch with Antrim, there's very rarely that they don't put on a really good show and a good display. Like, they, they put it up to any team. Like, in any grade and any team they play, like, whether they're, I suppose, a little bit above the team or they're, they're boxing higher against playing against the Galways or the Tipperaries or whatever, they always put in a good shift. Um, and in fairness to them, like, like you said, you know, they're never lacking in the scoring department. And James alluded to it there, like, that Neil McManus is usually the man leading the way, but the likes of Conan Cunning there and stuff, you know, they have scorers all over the pitch and they've great hurlers as well and the funny thing about it is like we're not questioning here Antrim coming into Leinster now and I suppose Leinster is now represented by three provinces now at this stage <laughs> never mind Munster not letting some of their own lads in but uh, you know no one's questioning Antrim coming in and Antrim bet you know the, the Kerry by one point yet there's such an argument to try and get Kerry into the Munster Championship like the whole thing doesn't make sense but not not going away from your question like Antrim have been racking up serious scores um, they're always a great team to watch like I was saying because because they do you know when you know you're going to watch a team that's going to rattle the net a good few times as you said Antrim have 25 times in the campaign why wouldn't you watch them? You know they are a great team. They bring they bring a savage work rate to, to games. Okay, they went a little bit flat against Kerry in the second half, but like that's that that can happen any team on any day. But um, no, they're they're a great team. Scores come from all angles with them. They have um, they've great hurlers all over the pitch as well, and they even play a lovely brand of hurling as well. So it's it's a credit to Antrum, uh, and I look really looking forward to seeing them in Leinster as well next year. You know because I think they'll bring a real savage edge to it as well. Um, but look, Antrim, full credit for the Joe McDonough win in fairness to them and look, really looking forward to what they'll bring next year. Yeah, three of the best matches I watched this year in hurling. Uh, the top one's still the Munster final because just the sheer quality in that final. But aside from that, Antrim Kerry, Joe McDonough Cup final. Kerry and Offaly in the Joe McDonough a few weeks back, which was a cracker of a game in Tralee. And the bits that I could see online from Antrim against Offaly, the game where Antrim were at home at the start of the Joe McDonough, where Antrim got a late goal to sneak a very high-scoring game between the two sides as well. There are three of the best games we've seen have actually been outside the top championship. They were in the second tier of Joe McDonough. The one thing I'm really hoping for, Scale, that might happen is that the Talton Cup has got remarkably good coverage. The Joe McDonough counties would kill to get the amount of coverage the Talton Cup has had. So last week, AIB were miking up Longford players between Longford and Fermanagh to bring out a web series. They were miking up awfully against New York this week and they're going to mic up teams in the semi finals. So it's going to be a full web series dedicated to the Talton Cup. GA Go showed two games in the Talton Cup quarter finals. They showed a game in both of the previous rounds. RT Television are showing both of the semi finals in the Talton. The final is on and the semi finals and final are on at Crow Park. Now, that means I know it's the first year of the Talton Cup and they're trying to give it as much coverage as possible. Can we get to a point scale where the Joe McDonough Cup gets as much coverage as the Talton Cup, given that it is the equivalent competition in hurling to Gaelic football? Because from my eyes, at least, there's a really good product there that's ready to be promoted. Yeah, the G, you touched on there with like the G are pushing the Talton Cup because it's 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 obviously its first year, it's, like it's inauguration at this stage, so that they they needed to work, you know, because I, I suppose there probably would have been questions. <clears throat> about introducing it in the first place, you know, because it can be seen as a second tier competition, which look, in essence it is, right? Um, but I think, I think Hurling is always second to football nationally, just for the sheer, obviously the, the number of counties that play it, uh, and probably the, 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 the difficulty in getting Hurling to catch on is because the difficulty around the sport itself, right? So I think the GEA need to push Hurling an awful lot more, and they need to put major focus onto, not the likes of Limerick, not the likes of Kikini, 
They need to put major focus into Antrim and Kerry and all these teams. And specifically in counties that are, are battling a sport that's probably second in their county, i.e. Kerry, you know. So do we get to that stage? I think we have to get to that stage. I don't I won't say yes or no, we have to get there. I think as an association, if the GE are trying to grow the game, which they all, they're always saying they are, they're always trying to grow the game, they need to put money where the mouth is this stage now and put some resources into the into all them counties, give them some coverage and try to get the get like a snowball effect, get it going bigger and bigger and bigger and hopefully that it's it, it pulls the counties from lower than that up then. So you want you want the you want down, you want Derry, you want you, know, you want all them teams to be rising up the way and for Antrim and Kerry to push into the All Ireland series. That's what you want. That's natural progression. Um but that's that doesn't seem like the plan, you know, for the GA. They they seem quite content to be offering the Munster final, offering the you know these games every now and then. If we get three or four cracking games during the years, like they're happy. You know, I just think there needs to be an awful lot more effort. That's a big task. Mm. Something I like to see from Antrim too. Uh, earlier today, they brought the Joe McDonough Cup for a bit of a walk around Caseman Park, and it was almost symbolic. This idea that you know eventually, maybe by 2025, 2026, depending what's going to happen, because the last few hurdles are now being overcome about the uh, planning applications and the appeals that were in against it and a big one of those was removed last week so it seems with the funding in place now too Case and Park is now ready to get the green light and for the builders to actually go in and do the revamp it'll be great to get to a point where not that Ballycastle hasn't worked out in recent years or not that Case and Park hasn't been a good home for Antrim but for them to, or Corrigan Park I should say to actually get back to Casement is going to be really important for Antrim hurling in the coming years and well they're going to have Leinster hurling for 2023 Leash drop into the Joe McDonough Cup which is going to be stacked next year because you're going to have Kerry, Leash, Offley, Carlo, Kildare up that's going to be a really really good and interesting championship next year too even with Antrim uh, going up uh, into the Leinster Championship Westmead staying up after their win against Leash in the last round so we've got to look forward to next year the crowd that was there Paul at the game was obviously disappointing again like Crow Park is a quarter full and I kind of had to resist when I saw a few people trying to claim the split season was the reason and I'm so tempted to say look at the fact that the Munster final is sold out tomorrow it's very clear this is about the product that's available but also the circumstance of the game and we spoke about this last week seven o'clock price of diesel the fact there were no late trains back to Galway available on last Saturday night you couldn't get a hotel room for loving or money if you tried to stay in Dublin for the weekend or even just stay for the Saturday these were all a turnoff, and the funny thing is if you look back at the attendances between Galway and Kilkenny and this is not me putting a slight murph on either of your two counties but there's never been a massive attendance for Leinster finals at Croke Park between the two like we've had a kind of go between low 20s I think 2012 was 22,000 up to about 35,000 in some of the finals between the teams over the last 15 years this shouldn't be a great surprise that Croke Park was far from full I knew when they're running into the game actually that I'm sure we were talking about last week that you know seven o'clock is just it, it, it's it's a crazy time for a match and I knew that put off a lot of people and like you said something I didn't think about we drove to the game but mm-hmm. a lot of people were relying on the train because they wanted to go up on the train maybe have a few points and come back um, you know as is part of a, a championship day but you know the fact that the game was on so late trains weren't coming back equally to Kilkenny as much as Galway um, so that put people off um, again I suppose you know if you're planning on bringing your family to Crow Park if the match is starting at seven o'clock and you're not going to be off there till half eight nine, I think it was nine o'clock maybe but by the time the, the, the cup is done getting back to the car it's a late night as well now that didn't deter there was a lot of kids up there the other day and it was it was actually great to see that regardless that you know it was a seven o'clock start there was still a huge amount of uh, underage um, you know I suppose clubs and different things brought brought kids up on buses and things so that was great but um, in terms of general overall attendance, like I suppose realistically, uh, uh, someone might correct me on the stats of it, but the Munster final, obviously, we looked at the Munster final, we saw a stacked Turles, but I can't remember how often over the last few years, you know, consistently, which is at 45,000, I think, Phil's Turles, right, we had 30,000 Crow Park the other day. You know, it's not unreasonable to get 40,000, 45,000 um, in Crow Park. We played Cork a few years ago, I think it was about 40,000 in Crow Park. That would have been a full Turles, you know, that would have been a savage atmosphere. In Crow Park, though, you know, 30,000, 40,000, you know, the, the atmosphere, it takes a lot for that crowd to make a savage atmosphere in Crow Park. Um, and it's quite obvious then as well, when the upper tiers aren't full, the canal end was pretty much empty as well. You know, it's quite obvious then. So, yeah, it's something I saw a lot of on Twitter as well, just that, you know, people were talking about moving it to Tullamore or different places as well. I, I understand the argument of that, um, or to a suitable size venue that might hold 40,000, which again, you're probably going back to Turles with that. But the other side is then as well, like, you know, players want to play in Crow Park and, you know, players look forward to playing in Crow Park. So that's where you want to play it. So 
it's a hard one to call, but I, I certainly do think that you probably would have had 10,000 more people or 15,000 more people at this game, potentially, probably 10, I'd say, if that game was at 4 o'clock on Saturday and which you had the Joe McDonough on before. Because again, the Kerry and Antrim people, they also had to deal with, you know, just a little bit of a later time, hotels in Dublin, all these things have to be factored in. So it certainly wasn't the most, I suppose, um, supporter-friendly game on Saturday evening because because of everything that feeds into it. Look, and we're talking economics here, the diesel, the trains not being around um, later in the evening and, and then the hotels as well. So look, I think if we want to... If we want to have maximum attendances at the games, um, regardless, I suppose, what else is going on with other sports, and I know Ireland were playing in different things, you know, um, it, it, you kind of have to have these games at a reasonable hour to give people a half a chance anyway. And I think if you had this game at, at four o'clock or half three even on a, on Saturday, I think there would have been 10,000 more people at the game, which would have been, you know, that would have been a notable difference at the game. Yeah. Um, the attendances, by the way, uh, Kilkenny against Galway 2016 final was 29,000, 2015 was 32,000, and 2012, which was a success for Galway against Kilkenny, was 22,171. Uh, so it just goes to show that this fixture hasn't always been full over the years. So just if the argument is that the split season has changed the game and that's the reason people weren't there, I think it's far more about the reasons that Murph was just talking about. Skell, this weekend we've got the primary quarter finals which are coming up. Uh, you've got Kerry at home against Wexford. It's difficult to kind of dust yourself down after playing a Joe McDonough Cup final, and especially like if you lose one and then have to go out and play the week afterwards. But the winners of that game will play against Clare, and Antrim then will host Cork, which maybe might be a bit of a banana skin for Cork with the way that Antrim have been going. The winners of that will play Galway. Do we see the possibility of something like 2019 where we were talking almost casually about Tipperary versus Dublin in the quarterfinal and then Dublin lost against Leash? Can you see either of the teams from last Saturday's McDonough Cup final pull off a shock this weekend? Um, well, I didn't see Wexford drawing with Westmead, to be honest. You know, I didn't see Goy losing that performance against Kinney. So, like, I, again, I want to go off evidence. Like, it's, it's say that you would imagine that Wexford would be Kerry and that Cork would be Dentron. You know, but there are... There's great, there's huge potential to stumble in these fixtures. Like Cork to Antrim is, is not a small trick, like you know. So there's, there's, there's a. It is a banana skin. There is, is, is the potential to happen. Of course, there's potential to happen. Will it happen? I don't believe so. I think there's probably a five percent chance that that either either Kerry or Antrim win. If both of them win, zero percent chance. <laughs> to be honest, that's just the way it is, right? I think that uh, especially after Wexford found, I suppose, a, a renewed element of form, and that Cork did the same thing towards the latter end of the group, the round robin. So they're coming to the situation on a positive and again like if the game is in the Melton posh like having a game seven days prior that's tough I'm sure Antrim went out and celebrated I'm sure Kerry went out and commiserated and had their own little celebration if you like so it's going to be too a monumental a monumental ask but I'm actually very intrigued to see how it does go because again we're, I'm always advocating that Kerry should be Munster I'm advocating that, 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 that these counties Antrim should be up in the, the Lee McCarthy etc so it's interesting to see now how they'll uh, how they'll pan out but again they have two tough tests ahead of them yeah, they get a little bit lost in the shuffle as well, Murph, when it comes to the coverage for this weekend. Because again, the football qualifiers have been understandably picked by Sky Sports, who've got the Saturday right. So there, Crow Park is a double header. You've got uh, Clare against Roscommon and Mayo against Kildare. Sorry, Clare against Roscommon and uh, you've got Mayo against Kildare. They're the two football games at Croker. So these two games are going to happen two o'clock on Saturday. So Antrim against Cork has been fixed for Corrigan Park, and Austin Stack Park and Tralee will host Kerry against Wexford. So those, both those games at 2 p.m. this coming Saturday. Murph, do you see any potential for a shock in either? Um, well, look, Cork going to Corrigan Park is not simple. We've seen it. like, And, and even just to factor in, just, you know, having to make that journey up to there and, and the potential, you know, for just players being a little bit lacklustre starting off the match, Corrigan Park has been a tough place to go. So I think if there is to be an upset, that could potentially be the one. Um, and look, I suppose we f- just factor in that, again, it's a potential banana skin for teams if they take their eye off the ball. I think Wexford have done it already. Not not that not to take away from Westmead's performance, but certainly Wexford didn't go to the pitch of the game against Westmead, which allowed Westmead to to get the draw there. Um, I I think they got their warning though, and I think they'll go down, especially after seeing the game at the weekend, seeing that Kerry given a bit of space, given a bit of time, they have the scores there and have the potential to hurt you. And Wexford won't want to do that. Like Wexford have, have now. I suppose, got themselves back into the championship where there was a fear that they were going to be out of it. They're now going to say, right, win this game now and, and move on. And that's what they'll want to do. So I think they'll, any, anything that, like Dara Egan will be looking at it saying, whatever the preparation was coming into the Westmead game, if there was any sort of complacency there within players, we need to take that out because 
look, at, there's nothing to say here. And I think it's going to be a good gauge, again, for that argument that we keep talking about, about Kerry coming into Munster. If they put in a good performance against Wexford, well, then you're going, well, look, they're not 20, 30 points behind Wexford. Now, if they take a bit of a beating, again, I suppose people will say they shouldn't be coming into it. But I think the, the, if there is to be a banana skin here and a bit of a slip-up, I think Cork won't find it simple up in Corrigan Park. Um, Antrim won't make it easy for him, and, and Antrim have nothing to lose here. Like They won't be expected to win this match. And we've seen him beat Wexford and Clare up there last year. So, look, it's they, I think Antrim will have a savage crack at them. They'll see what happens. And, again, it all comes down to if they're in if last 15 or 10 minutes, if they're still within a chance in the game, you don't know what could happen. But, like James was saying, I, I'm not giving it a huge chance of happening, <laughs> not to be bad on Antrim or Kerry, but I just think teams now, like Cork and Wexford, have got their warning this year. And I think they kind of have their bullseye now in the quarterfinals. So, I'm expecting... You know, Cork and Wexford come out of this now with, uh, with with two wins. And just another couple bits of news coming out of the weekend. Uh, Clare beat Leash in the last of the round robin games in the quarterfinals of the All Ireland Minor Championship. So twenty one points to one goal in twelve, uh, which means we've now got the lineup complete for the last four. Uh, so Scale involved with the Galway Miners this year. They'll take on the Munster champions Tipperary on Saturday week. While it'll be Clare against Offaly in those semi finals, they're still to be fixed. And the other piece of news, Gal Liam Cal on Show Sport, which is back on TG Car on a Friday night, uh, confirming his full intention is to be the Waterford manager next season. So he said he was going to take a little bit of time. It's been a few weeks since he went out of the championship, but it seems that he's still going to be in charge of the Dacia next year. Unlikely their county board are going to make a decision that's not him bringing them back into training in December. Yeah, and like well, again, if it's, it's like if you replace Liam Cal, who do you replace him with, to be honest? You know? So like he's it's, his stock hasn't decreased that much because Walsh for him to the championship. Like there's obviously reasons for him to the championship. He's probably the best in the best position to analyze those reasons and try fix them, try rectify them. You know they were the they were the hot team. They were the player of the of the of the current. You know only a few weeks back. So we were talking about on the podcast how they were going to challenge Limerick and potentially dethrone Limerick. They were going so well, it just didn't work out that way. So there's reasons behind that. So I think he's he's best equipped and in the best position to do so. And that, that's the best thing for for Watford too. He showed faith in them last year by you know, committing to the Waterford job and not jumping over to Tipperary. So I think the, I think that should be reciprocated by Waterford now. Yeah, don't listen back to those old pods, folks. We were talking about Clare all the way. We've been on the Clare bandwagon since episode one. There was no talk about Waterford. We're driving the bus. We're driving the bandwagon. <laughs> yeah, we're driving now, yeah. From front seat, we were kind of we were rotating drivers on that bandwagon along the way. And uh, we were 100% behind that. We never mentioned Waterford. We had doubts about Waterford throughout the league, even after the league final. There's no way we said things like, this Waterford team might have the best panel in the country and Limerick could be in trouble later in the summer if Waterford get a good steam behind them. Never said that. Never happened. <laughs> Lads, that is episode 16. We'll be back next week for uh, episode 17 and we'll look forward to the All-Ireland quarterfinals. It's all coming around very quickly now. Thanks a million for joining us on the Hurling Pod.